the Vox Markets podcast with Justin Waite. Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy anything based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research. Welcome to the podcast on Monday the 22nd of February 2021. On the podcast today, I have... On the markets, CFO Clive Beatty discussing their update on their trading for the year to the end of the 31st of January 2021, which is ahead of expectations. Also on the podcast, Alan Green, CEO of Brand Communications, talks about Avacta, Catna Innovations, Rambler Metals and Mining, and Tertiary Minerals. And as always, I have two lists for you at the end of the podcast. Top five most followed companies on Vox Markets in the last 24 hours, and the top five most liked or read RNSs too. You can see both these lists at voxmarkets.co.uk. We'll see lots of other content. In fact, there's something there on Polarian Imaging announcing new board appointment, Empire Metals uh, acquisition of 75% in Eclipse Gold project, Clear Leisure raises 1 million to advance cryptocurrency plans, and that's rocketing today because uh, John Story is the guy behind that million pound he's put up there. And uh, John's got a good track record. He came on the podcast a while back. Um, check that out, all at voxmarkets.co.uk. And also you can see, of course, our COVID-19 index. Avact is at the, at the top there, up 9.3%. And the biggest faller is E Therapeutics, down 6.5% at 23 pence. Uh, check that out at voxmarkets.co.uk. Vox Markets is an online community of investors that runs a free mobile and desktop platform that allows you to track news and updates about any UK listed company. Offering RNS push notifications, detailed charts, pricing data, and much more. Find out more at voxmarkets.co.uk forward slash app. And joining me on the podcast right now is Clive Beatty, Chief Financial Officer of On the Market OTMP. Sticker there. Clive, thanks for joining me. Justin, good morning. Thank you for having me this morning. Yeah, and it's, uh, you've released a post-year in trading and operation update, and it's uh, trading ahead of expectations. Very good. We'll dig into that as always. But uh, as always, Clive, if someone is listening right now, not quite familiar with uh, On The Market, and uh, maybe they sort of heard of you, uh, but uh, just explain what you're all about, please. Of course. So On The Market is uh, a property portal, uh, and we list on the portal uh, properties for sale or for let, uh, that uh, people interested in buying and renting properties can come to the portal, uh, see the properties and get in touch with the agents or house builders concerned. Um, but we also provide a range of ancillary information and services around that. So really looking to provide both uh, our customers, the agents and the house builders and consumers with a range of uh, value added services relating to property transactions. Excellent stuff. OK, so uh, trading ahead of expectations. Take us through some of the figures if you could live. Yes, yeah, so um, we did uh, do a brief update uh, late last year, uh, uh, but we are trading slightly ahead of even that update. Um, you know, we've had a good uh, Christmas New Year January. Um, so at the moment, our year end is January. So 31st of January 21 is our year end just gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're expecting revenues for the year to be around 23 million. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is up from uh, financial year 20, uh, where we did 18.8 million. Uh, and obviously that year as well, the 23 million covers the period when we were giving discounts and things uh, for COVID. Um, so, you know, not quite an ordinary year. Uh, at the same time, our adjusted operating profit now, we're expecting to be about uh, 2.3 million, uh, which compares with a loss of 9.2 million. Uh, now, again, that's COVID affected. And in some ways, you know, we did, as I think you know, uh, reduce some of our expenditure on both marketing particularly, but also staff. So, again, not necessarily a normal year, but nevertheless, you know, for us, uh, when we went into COVID, if we could have imagined coming out with uh, strong revenue growth uh, and uh, the cost and, and cash discipline to come out with a, an operating profit and a strong cash position, cash at the year end was 10.7 million. So we're very happy with that. Yeah, like I say, it, it, it was a very different year. And even though it was, it's very encouraging, top line went up, like you say, uh, 23 million versus 18.8. And that's including all the discounts you gave due to COVID. But then again, you have to look at the, uh, like the profit. Like you said, you didn't spend as much marketing because uh, obviously people are locked down and stuff. So it's hard to know. So, so going forward, how is this going to change? I assume you, you say there that, um, that uh, marketing spend is going to go up again. Is that right? Yes, exactly. So, uh, you know, we, we, the year just gone has been an unusual year and we wouldn't expect that level of, you know, that lower level of marketing expenditure. So we're already planning to go back to more usual levels. We're also planning to invest further in, uh, in headcount um, you know, a lot of our uh, services and products we offer are effectively uh, developed by IT uh, development team. Um, so to invest there in, in growth of the services and products and, and improvements in existing ones. 
Um, so, for example, um, just over Christmas again, we launched uh, a new uh, product on the on the uh, on the site called Value My Home, mm-hmm. uh, and this is where if you're a consumer and you're interested to know what your house might be worth, uh, you can come onto our site, click on the value of my home, put in some details, uh, and get an estimate of the valuation. So, you know, if you're thinking about a potential move, you know, it's often a good way to start. And then through that, you can contact agents, etc. If you want to take further. Yeah, yeah. So it's those yeah. sorts of uh, things that we'll be developing and investing in, uh, along with the, uh, along with the marketing spend going back to more usual levels. Yeah, yeah. And you said that there, that property valuation uh, service has led to uh, increased valuation leads uh, with agents and stuff. And uh, I see your your average uh, what's well, a lead is, is doing very well. The, the, the figures there, isn't it? Yeah, so we're, we're, again, the consumer engagement has been strong. And, um, you know, since COVID, clearly the agency and house builder markets have been strong themselves. Uh, you know, once the uh, first lockdown ended, uh, they've been very strong. There's been incentives such as the huge relief. So a range of measures uh, that have led to busy markets. But nevertheless, uh, you know, for us, we think, you know, we're getting, uh, I'd say, about 28 million uh, uh, visits in January. And we think we have a high proportion of those that are around what we would call active property seekers, you know, people who are actually in the market looking to buy, sell, rent, let, etc., uh, rather than just casual browsing. And that leads to the uh, to the leads we did, 1.8 million leads in January, average of 146 per advertiser. If we go back actually a year ago in January last year, pre-COVID, um, still quite busy markets, but we were doing about 126 there. So again, you know, good growth. Uh, and that is, you know, that is increasing the value we're turning to our, our advertising customers by way of leads. Yeah, so even, it's, it's, it's hard to get, it's, it's, COVID has really muddied the waters a bit, but uh, with, even with COVID there, you, you're confident there you are making definite positive progress, is that right? No, I think absolutely. You know, I, I think, um, you know, COVID was a challenge, um, mm. but actually, particularly on the, uh, on the consumer engagement side, it really was an opportunity because we cut back on the marketing. It did demonstrate to us that actually we do have much more brand engagement, much more consumer engagement with the website. Mm. Uh, you know, many more people now have the app or are signed up to receive emails, etc. cetera, um, because I guess they value, you know, what we can, we can bring to them. Um, you know, I think, you know, one of our, uh, our differences with our proposition is we are uh, heavily agent owned uh, and obviously they support us and, and we're very grateful for that. You know, one of those ways is that um, we do get thousands of properties each month from those agents uh, listed on us 24 hours or more before they're on Rightmove or Zoopla. Mm-hmm. And indeed, we have some agents who list only uh, on, on the market. So we do have properties that you can either see first for that period or potentially only see on our portal. And I think consumers are increasingly aware of that. Uh, and if you are a consumer, you want to see whole of market and see 100%, you, you need to come to on the market to do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, before, maybe, uh, I'd say, uh, Jason is uh, now the CEO. It'd be nice to get him on very soon. How is, how are you settling in? Uh, very well indeed. Um, so absolutely no problems. He kicked off formally, I think, you know, on 14th of December. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been a very busy time for him, as you can imagine. So uh, it's, uh, I don't think he's going to be sitting back and uh, resting too much for the foreseeable future. Um, but a number of new initi- initiatives underway. Um, you know, we've already talked since he's been on. We've launched the Value My Home. We've got a number of other initiatives in the pipeline, uh, looking to uh, both provide greater value through the things we already offer, but also add to the offering, um, you know, pro- products and services that can be supplied to either our customers or to consumers throughout the life cycle of a property transaction. Uh, and I think that's a direction you'll see us uh, increasingly move on as we go through the current year, uh, is to, to broaden that uh, product offering. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And obviously we can't uh, just chat without mentioning sort of this, this cliff that's uh, impending, that's coming forward, and that's the, that's the uh, stamp duty holiday, of course, the break. And uh, uh, ex- explain what happened, and if you could, and, and what do you think is going to happen and how it will affect the market, if you could, Clive. Yeah, so what happened was the Chancellor brought in a relief such that uh, you, you know, the stamp duty that you would normally pay uh, up to 500000 that was waived up to a property value of 500000 mm. uh, So effectively, the stamp duty on a 500000 property for most buyers, and first buyers and so, but for most buyers, that uh, could save you £15,000. Uh, but that was brought in for a temporary period, which expires in March. Um, now, there is some debate about whether that should or will be extended. I don't think we'll know that before the budget, so uh, another couple of weeks before we probably know for certain. But what has uh, happened in the meantime is that as people have sought to get their transactions uh, completed in advance of that to benefit from the saving, uh, we saw very busy uh, new instructions 
uh, latter half of last year, uh, la- you know, third, uh, fourth quarter last year, coming up to Christmas. Lots of properties coming to market to try and do that. We've probably seen a quietening of that. So actually, this year, you know, beginning of this year, the new instructions generally been quiet. I think the, one of the reasons is that you know people don't anticipate that if you're only starting a property transaction now, that you'll be able to complete that in time for the stamp duty deadline at the end of March. Yeah. Um, whereas uh, you know there is a you know agents have a lot of transactions on their books. I think for agents at the moment they are busy uh, completing on transactions that have already been instructed, uh, and, they're, and they're very busy on that. There are lots of those. Indeed, there's a concern that even many of the ones already instructed won't be able to complete before the deadline for stamp duty. Mm. Uh, but I think it has led to a quietening of new instructions. Uh, and I think generally people are uncertain on the markets. Um, obviously, key announced today about uh, roadmaps out of lockdown and so forth. So I think people you know, have paused to see, well, what, what does it mean? How does lockdown end? What does it mean for everyone's life, etc.? So, uh, you know, a general quietening in the market, I'd say, is, is currently being experienced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... and um... Uh, yeah, like I said, uh, any ideas? I mean, I suppose you have no inside knowledge on this because everyone's speculating, but uh, I suppose it makes sense to the people who've applied beforehand to give them that chance to, you know, conduct their... their I, I don't know if that's going to happen. I mean, are there thoughts that you will extend it for a certain group of people who already applied or it's going to be extended? Any ideas what's going to happen? I, I have to say I don't have any insight, so, mm. uh, I, you know, hopefully no one will try and do anything based on anything I say. But, uh, um, no, I mean, there's speculation that either it'll just be extended full stop or it'll be extended for people who have already got to a certain stage uh, or, or that none of those will happen. It will just end as it's currently scheduled. So yeah. I think, you know, it's very uncertain at the moment. Um, but I think there are thousands and thousands of transactions already underway that will miss the deadline if it doesn't get extended. So, you know, there is some pressure there, uh, as you say. Um, the trouble with any cliff edge thing is this, you know, this always happens. Obviously, it, it drags, in, in our sense, the property world, it will drag transactions forward and then you might expect it to be a bit quieter after it. Yeah. Um, but, but you, you know, at the end of the day, you know, obviously COVID was quite exceptional, had to do things to stimulate markets, the economy, and it seems to have, uh, you know, been very helpful in doing that. So we'll yeah. just have to see uh, what the Chancellor does in the budget. But, um you know, we're hopeful that there'll be some form of uh, uh, of extension, uh, so that you know the agents and, of course, consumers trying to sell can can get transactions through. Yeah, and I suppose what the, the main thing is, is it's the uncertainty, isn't it? Once well, it's, well, it's cleared, I mean, that'll help. Well, either way, even, even if he doesn't extend it, at least people know then where they stand, because it's that uncertainty, I suppose, isn't it, that's stopping the market, stop people put their houses in the market and all that stuff, isn't it, I suppose? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, once there's certainty, I mean, an event like this may lead to a bit of a blip, you know, sort of slightly busier before, slightly quieter after, but over time it would obviously smooth out, and, and I think you're quite right, you know, at the end of the day, if you've got certainty, you can plan around it, but when times are uncertain, that's, that's the current the yeah, yeah, more stuff. Okay, Clive, thanks for that. As always, if you could finish off with um, three reasons if someone's liking the sound of the progress you're making but are not yet following the story, uh, three reasons why they should hit that follow button on your page on Vox Markets and add on the market to their watch list, please. Yes, of course. Um, so, well, the first really uh, around the schedule is uh, that we've released is continuing to provide you know strong growth uh, and combining that with financial discipline, good cash and cost management. So I think that's important for investors. Um, secondly, on the operational side, the metrics are strong. You know, we're still seeking to increase value to both customers and consumers uh, through improving and broadening our range of products and services. But we're getting good consumer engagement, and good leads back to our uh, advertising customers. And I think the third comes back to a point we discussed: the differentiated proposition. You know, we do have a lot of agent ownership, but that does give us a lot of agent support. That does give us our new and exclusive offering uh, and some of our exclusive uh, only agents. So I think that side of things, you know, continuing to work with agents putting agents at the core of our proposition, both now and in the future, sustainably fair pricing. I think all that sets us apart and hopefully uh, that, that will pay benefits as we go forward. Excellent stuff. Good to chat to you, Clive, and hopefully we'll catch up in the not-too-distant future. Thanks very much. Thank you, Justin. Have a great day. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waits. And joining me on the podcast right now is Alan Green, CEO of Brand Communication, Jarrell. Good morning, Justin. I'm very well. Thanks. How are you, sir? Yes, I'm all right. You know, it's... Um yeah, well, I'm looking forward to uh, the sort of easing or slow easing of the lockdown, you know, starting today and uh, chat about that. And uh, I know we sort of know what's going on, but uh, it seems we are on the roadway out, you know. 
it really does feel like that for the first time in I don't know how long. You know, the the you know, we're out walking the dogs and you're speaking to people. Oh yes, I've been vaccinated. Popped over to Eastbourne, had it, had my jab. So so, and then obviously nationally we hear it's I think 18, 19 million now been vaccinated. That's a huge chunk of the population. So there's a real sense it's moving on. And obviously once that's done, then we can have the pubs reopen. We can you know people can have the prospect of perhaps. Uh, going away on holiday maybe not abroad but certainly a staycation in any event which is which is fantastic you know so the, the real prospect of, of life returning to normal so very exciting stuff yeah yeah cool Okay, what's the first stock up, Val? We chatting about Cat and Eye Innovation. C T E A is the epic code, and of course, Cat and Eye shares currently trading at uh, I think two and a half p. They've been as high as nine or ten p on the year, and and as low as uh, as a penny, I believe, or, or, or just below that. But uh, Cat and I have uh, they're a blockchain company, and of course, the company um, have uh, uh, um, been working for a number of years uh, using blockchain based technology to uh, to provide. Uh, immutable record keeping services for um, for the commercial sector there's good ex- examples with uh, uh, an insurance contract they have and also with the leisure sector and uh, with various football clubs to record information um, for, uh, 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 about the about the clubs and and the various associations that they work with but um, last year the the company took a, a step into in, in, into uh, uh, covid and testing um, the, it was restructured, uh, uh, a new board was brought in. Guy Meyer, of course, is the chief executive. And Brian Thompson is on the board too. He's a he's a, a, an entrepreneur up in Newcastle um, and he owns 29% of the company now. Um, and they developed a, a, a blockchain-based app called CoveID, which basically reflects and records a, an individual status. Um, and, uh, of course, the intention was to uh, put this in front of the UK government and to, and to hopefully be selected for um, uh, for testing and and put, um, ultimately of course use uh, 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 use by an individual uh, whenever they're traveling and moving so in line with the antigen test you've then got uh, an app recorded uh, an app that records via blockchain an individual status um, and the most recent testing they've undergone um, so lastly the app was tested uh, with Newcastle premier premier health um, a project t- trial was very successful um, and several developments took place they also signed a joint venture with a boss bar Botswana-based company to develop Africa ID, um, which uh, is across the the southern um, African states. Um, that's some 346 million people, um, and uh, they are in in the process of developing for the uh, for 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 Africa. Um, January this year, um, the company raised a million pounds. Um, uh, issued 50 million new shares and also converted 50,000 of director shares uh, or, or 50,000 of director remuneration into shares too. So the directors are very much taking share-based payments rather than financial payments. Um, and uh, progress through through today uh, where we've just had an update from the company this morning. They've been invited by the UK government's department of uh, a digital culture and media and sport to participate in developing an, a digital ID policy um, um, uh, uh, development uh, and integrating the app that they have in with that. They've also been invited by Public Health Scotland to do the same and of course the app is already certified to ISO 27001 which uh, I don't understand what that means but that's obviously um, a verification and a strong stamp of approval um, and uh, the so this, this test process is now taking place and of course, if it is selected, um, once again, it could be absolutely huge for Cat and I. And bear in mind that Cat and I's got a market cap, the trading 2.6 p has got a market cap of just over 7 million. So that's a, a real a real sort of a tip of the iceberg job if it is selected to uh, to supply the app to, or, or, or supply the official app to uh, to reflect a, an individual um, identity. So again, very very exciting times for this company. We've already seen the share price explode as high as uh, as 9 or 10 P, I think, last year. But, um, you know, if this does, if, if this is confirmed going forward, then, of course, it's uh, it could be a, a Many times multi bagger, but um, that's just my personal opinion. Okay, yeah, well, it's just person, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't say that many times multi bagger. Don't say that, please. Okay, uh, multi bagger then. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll, I'll take the many times out. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Uh, cool, what's next, Al? Cat and I there. 
Okay, so we're moving to mining now. Now, of course, we're, we've spoken about uh, um, how the, the, the current crisis has perpetuated a resurgence in metals and mining. And one of the metals that has had an absolutely spectacular run uh, since it collapsed uh, last year is uh, copper. And, of course, copper has recovered. It was trading at, um, at uh, $8,000 a ton, I think, in uh, at the start of January. And uh, as we, uh, I think, up to last Friday, it was just just under nine thousand dollars a ton, so it's heading in the right direction. Um, and uh, the company's Rambler Metals and Mining. So the company's tra- shares of trade as high on the year as uh, as two p and as low as zero point two one p. It's just trading zero point three four p above that uh, now. Um, and the reason being that. Uh, um, uh, in February, the company announced a placing uh, to raise 10 million uh, to, uh, to 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 basically invest into and uh, further develop the, um, the, the 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 mine that the company operates. So uh, details on that mine: it's uh, the, the company are based in Newfoundland in Canada, um, and uh, they have uh, a, a, a mine on the uh, it's, it's it's the Ming Copper Gold Mine in Newfoundland, a Labrador, and um, the, the 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 mine was in operation and then ceased because the uh, the deposit reached the third property boundary. Um, that property was then subsequently bought by Rambler and integrated into the mine. So of course they were able to to to, to recommence mining. Um, it has excellent infrastructure there, uh, including roads, fresh water, um, electricity, access to a working port, um, and uh, uh, the company also owns a a mill to process the ore, um, which is some forty kilometres from the from the from the main mine so they uh, the, the company clearly hit uh, hit tough times last year but um, uh, in an operational update uh, at the start of the year the company said it had been a challenging year but um, the the uh, the company was focused on accelerating the mine development and getting production back up to uh, previous levels which are some 1350 tons of ore um, uh, uh, per day so um, so well on route to doing that it's fully funded now to be able to achieve that, and um, we're, given the direction the copper prices is, is going in, this could be a very exciting year for the company, which still um, has a very mod- modest market cap of 37 million for a company with an operating mine uh, uh, that's actually producing copper. So, uh, uh, a very exciting year and prospect for Rambler Metals. Yeah, copper. Mm. It's hot, isn't it? It's hot copper, mate. It really is. Yeah, it's going places. I mean, just look at the price performance. You know, since the start of the year, but um, you know, it, it it collapsed last year with COVID, of course. But um, the, the, you know, let, let's also not forget it's an integral part of batteries. And um, you know, going forward, the battery industry, the giga factories spring up all over the world. This is a it's a core requirement of batteries. So um, copper is is going places. It really is. Mm-hmm. More of the stuff. Oh, thanks, that for anything else. Anything else we're chatting about? Yeah, just for a quick update on tertiary minerals. Of course, tertiary minerals is uh, has uh, a, a number of properties in uh, in the Nevada in uh, sorry in in, uh, in Nevada, USA, in the Walker Lane Gold Belt. Um, and uh, uh, at, since the start of the year, um, it uh, it uh, has. It has completed soil sampling at the Paymaster Polymetallic Project and developed new targets. Today announced it was starting to, to drill. Today, what's what it calls the Lucky Copper Project, um, it's identified an immediate target with copper mineralization, uh, which needs confirming and putting into context. Interesting uh, situation on the price action here. Currently, currently trading at, at 0.5p, gives it a market cap of just under six million. Um, the the company. Uh, um, uh, uh, engaged with with a company called Precious Metals Capital Group last year to undertake a share subscription. Um, Six hundred thousand pounds was uh, uh, was the the fee the company paid. So that went into tertiary coffers, and the company's gradually been um, uh, uh, issuing those shares into the market, which has had the effect of creating a price overhang for tertiary. So of course, every time the price goes up, um, Precious Metal Capital Group uh, requests more shares are issued, which brings it back down again. Um, most of the shares have now been issued, so uh, there are just sixty thousand pounds worth of shares left to issue. So one tenth of the initial um, uh, of the initial uh, um, uh, uh, subscription. Uh, once those are issued, I would expect the share price to make more progress, particularly considering the raft of projects Tertiary has and uh, and the progress they're now making. So exciting year and possibly for Tertiary too. 
Well, it's all exciting, Al, isn't it? It is. Very. Uh, marvellous stuff. Where is, where is Tushy done well on the, on the chart? What's the chart looking like? Uh, well, it, it's come, so if you look, we look at the, uh, the the one year chart, I mean, we've come up, you know, the shares have literally, well, I, I think uh, they popped up to 0.3, 0.3p in October, but been about 0.2, 0.24p, which is more or less where um, Precious Metal Capital, Precious Metal Capital Group were um, uh, issuing the shares into the market. But uh, since the start of the year, you've seen, you can see where the, where the price has gone. It's uh, it's uh, been uh, over 0.6p intraday, uh, 0.5p, 58p on 12th of Feb last week. Um, so yeah, I think um, I think uh, uh, I, I, I would expect expect further progress before the year's out. Marvellous stuff. Cheers, Al. And uh, we'll speak to you next week. Thanks, Josh. Speaking this week, mate. Cheers. OK, it's time for the top five most followed companies on Vox Markets in the last 24 hours. Uh, they are at five. Ridgecrest, down 26% to 1.5. At four, Rambler, Metals and Mining. Of course, uh, Alan talked about those in the podcast. Up 3%, uh, 0.35. At three, Clear Leisure, up 80%, 2.25. At two, Argo Blockchain, down 1.6%. In fact, Bitcoin's starting to roll over a bit. Be interesting to see where it goes, if it comes down or just goes sideways. Um, and at one, Avacta Group, down 9.29%. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, up, I mean, nearly 10% to £2. Nice round figure there. Okay, top five most read RNSs are as follows. At five, Rambler Metals and Mining, appointment of Ned. Well done, Ned. Ned's very popular. Gets appointed in a lot of companies. At four, Clear Leisure Group, placing to raise £1 million. Uh, John's story behind that, of course. At three, Orosol Mining, Columbia Update. At two, Argo Blockchain, uh, Priority Supply Agreement with the Argo and Epic. Or Epic. And at one, it's uh, Avacta Group, Press Speculation. Uh, check that out at voxmarkets.co.uk. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waite. Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy anything based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research.